Yeah, there's one there in the white shirt. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Joshua Boyd, popularly known as Kali J. I'm a digital influencer. Um, I'm a chef on Twitter. I cook politicians and all that. Yeah. So um, I have I have two questions. Um, one is about the um, the brain drain in the country. Um, the Ghana at the moment you have a very youthful population, and most of the youth are leaving the country. They are all going to the UK and the United States, Europe, trying to find jobs because um, we're told that the payroll is full and there are no jobs in the country. Um, I've, I've seen the 24-hour economy, I've done my research, and I think it's a brilliant policy, by the way. But aside that, what other policies are being put in place to reduce the brain drain? And also the second thing is, I, um, a lot of us keep saying that all politicians are friends. So what is the assurance that if you are elected into office again, um, politicians and people that have been heavily involved in state capture will be prosecuted and um, put behind bars. Thank you very much. And uh, Kalije, I've heard your name. Yeah, my son Sharaf has spoken about you uh, several times. But thank you very much for what you do. Um, like, you see, Migration itself is not a bad thing, but it must be organized migration. And so if you look at countries like Philippines, they have organized migration. And so what they do is they give their young people skills training in hospitality, in nursing, home care, in uh, seafaring, in so many other uh, vocations and they organize and export them to other countries. You know how much Philippines makes every year from organized migration? $30 billion. $30 billion a year. And so migration of professionals is not a, a, entirely a bad thing, but it must happen in an organized manner. And that's why at one point I said that people will leave anyway, but we must create the situation in which when they leave, it is organized departure. And so, for instance, if we have nurses and there's an excess of them and we cannot immediately find them employment, there are countries that are uh, 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 prepared to accept them on short-term work abroad contracts. And so we can sign agreements with those countries and say, look, we're going to send you this number of nurses for two years or three years. Apart from the fact that they'll go earn an income, be able to remit it back home, they also will go and add to their skills in those countries and come back even better prepared than before. And so, if you go to a country like Korea, they are taking what they call foreign workers in different uh, aspects, even in the agricultural sector, just to go and help them to bring in the harvest, pick the apples and all that. And I remember when we were young and in school, some of our colleagues, during the long vacation, they used to Japan to Europe and go and pick apples and things and earn an income, come back and continue. And so if we organize it properly, it won't be our young people walking across the Sahara Desert and losing their lives and so on and so forth. But it will be more organized. They'll go on fixed term contracts. They'll work, come back even more experienced than they did before. So it's not entirely a bad thing. But we must work to open the opportunities for our young people in our own country. And that is why we talk about the 24-hour economy. Most of our businesses are running one shift. We go at eight, we close at five. And so this morning, a young lady explained it very well. She says the formula is one, three, three. And so one, three, three means that one person, one uh, job, three people, three shifts. And so instead of one person working, there will be three people on three shifts. And it is possible to do in the pharmaceutical industry. We say that there is no demand. There is demand in West Africa. When I gave our pharmaceutical industry a stimulus package to expand their production lines, Tobinko, Dan Adams, NS Chemist, all of them, they did that and they began to export 
Ghanaian pharmaceutical products to Sierra Leone, to Liberia, to Burkina Faso, to Mali, and other countries. And so who says that if we give incentives and support our industries, they will not be able to increase their production? And because they had increased their production, expanded their production lines, it made them employ more people. That's just one example. There are many other areas, the construction industry, the uh, agro-processing industry, cleaning and sanitation. Who says we shouldn't collect bola in the night? In the night, even there's less traffic. So it's even more conducive to collect bola in the night than to be mixing with traffic during the daytime. So there are many places where the 24-hour economy will produce more work. But in the digital space, we can create tens of thousands of jobs. And that is why I built the Accra Digital Center. We estimated that it will create 10,000 jobs. Unfortunately, we left office after I had commissioned it. And so it was for this government to operationalize it. Unfortunately, the space has been given to uh, Yanum, and they are doing their own thing there. And so it's not realizing exactly the objective for which we set up the place. But like I said, we're going to put investments in FinTech, $50 million, to grow uh, uh, entrepreneurs in the FinTech space. We're going to uh, put money into construction, the big, uh, the big push for transformational infrastructure, in order that contractors and construction companies can employ more young civil engineers, employ masons, carpenters, steel benders, welders, uh, uh, tractor operators, dump truck operators, excavator operators. And so those are all things that will stimulate the economy. But one group, one group that we want to push, promote, and create are the agri-business people to provide agro-processing services for our farmers so that they can buy the products of our farmers, add value to the products, sell on the local market, or export. If you go to um, um, OT, they produce a lot of ginger. There's no ginger factory there. We must put up a ginger factory to produce ginger powder, ginger oil, and it's the private sector that is going to do it for export and local consumption. Look at this, our red hot pepper. You know the demand for it. If we encourage the farmers to grow it, and I get you Kali J, give you money, you set up a plant for producing pepper powder, pepper oil, and all that, we can sell on the local market and also export. And so I've always said that, yes, under 1D1F, some factories were built. But the thing is, factories and manufacturing do not flow. Do <laughs> factories and manufacturing do not follow political delineation. They follow source of supply of raw material. And so if you want to be successful in agro-processing, you just don't say one district, one factory. If you take cashew nut, it is grown all across Bono and Bono East. So you must look at the whole cashew growing zone and say, look, we need two factories in these two regions to process all our cashew. If you take cassava, cassava grows here. We need this number of factories to produce, uh, process our cassava into cassava starch, into cassava flour, for uh, bakery, for beer uh, manufacturing and all that. So we are going to put those factories and uh, manufacturing processes using the private sector, not, not the state, to process based on staple processing zones where raw materials are available and not sloganeering, one district, one factory, one village, one dam, one million dollars per year. It sounds nice to the east. It sounds nice to the but does it really? It might, it might sound nice. And that's why you go and find. I was going somewhere in the western region. I've forgotten where it was. And there was this building. I said, oh, wow. And I saw a sign, 1D1F. One one and I said, let me take a look at it. And so I made a convoy stop and I got down. It was locked. And the gate was locked. And there was a rice processing factory. Building complete, everything complete, no equipment in it. And there was only a caretaker. They said, are they working here? I said, no, no, no work. That machine, no day. They wait to make machine come. 
you know. And so we must do this because we believe in it and not because we think that it will win us elections. It says politicians are friends. Yes, we have friends across the political divide. And I have many friends. I've been in politics from 1996 when I stood for my first parliamentary election. I met many colleagues in parliament. But the call to root out corruption and to punish people who have misappropriated public funds is a call from the soul of the nation. It is a call from the soul of the, of the nation that for once we must put our foot down because the youth are crying for opportunities and the youth are losing faith in our democracy and the youth are tired of being unemployed and hungry when they can see that the public resource that belongs to all of us is being corralled and squandered by a few people. And so if we don't do that, a time will come when some things will happen. There are two things that can happen. If people lose faith in our democracy and that faith is going down, the last survey it said it had gone from 74% to 50% of young people believe in our democracy. And so their faith in our democracy is going down. And as you continue to subject them to 000, 010, 100, 001, a time comes when they have no interest in the survival of the state or in the survival of our democracy. And in West Africa, normally what would happen is that a coup d'etat will take place. But in East Africa, civil unrest will take place, like we saw recently in Kenya. And so it is a cry from the people themselves that the political elite must get it right. This is our last chance at saving our democracy. And it cannot be business as usual. And that's why I've said that the, the greatest fight against corruption is not prosecuting your political opponents. It is also dealing with your own people when they indulge in the same thing. And so I've said it several times that yes, we'll hold the government that is going out accountable for the things that have happened. We'll investigate them. We have a constitution, we'll go by the rule of law, prosecutions will take place, judgment will be given. And so that will do. But while you're doing that, if your people start indulging in the same thing, you must have the courage to punish them. And that's why I've said, if people want to come into government and make money, then we can help you. You go into the private sector. We'll help you set up a cassava processing plant. Go and process cassava, employ young people. Don't come and take public office. Once you take public office, you must be prepared to be held to account. And so, yes, we might be friends, Sometimes it's painful. And I have an example. Abu Gapele is my friend. The National Youth uh, Authority himself and others were prosecuted during my tenure. I was not happy to do it, but I mean, one has got to do what he's got to do. And so, yes, we'll pursue corrupt officials and we'll deal with them. And when we're dealing with them, if somebody does the same in our, our uh, um, uh, administration, that person will also be dealt with. So I've sounded a warning. Everybody who wants to be a minister, a CEO in Jomabe's administration, if the Office of Special Prosecutor comes after you, you are on your own. I'm not a clearing agent. I will not clear you.